get more engaged with Acres USA and our community. Uh, last year, we started Healthy Soil Summit in Davis, California. This year, we're going virtual uh, for obvious reasons and going to be broadcasting it around the world. Uh, we do plan to return to the West Coast in 2021 with a physical event. Uh, you can learn more about this event, including our lineup of speakers. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, you want to learn more. Uh, excuse me, uh, Michael Phillips and Klaus Mountains, Mimi Castile and Nicole Masters, Glenn Ravenberg will be speaking. Um, anyway, you can register, learn more at soil.acresusa.com. Again, soil.acresusa.com. Uh, you can learn all about the event we'll be doing later on this month. Today, we're going to be talking about humic acids, which is um, can be misunderstood or uh, not known in a lot of farming circles, but it's really important in the biological farming world and certainly in the organic farming world. Uh, Humic acids are, are biological stimulants that really have a, a hormone-like effect on growing plants and help improve soil structure, stimulate your soil life. A lot of our instructors within our community teach that humic acids uh, can be added to any really any liquid plant food, nitrogen, herbicide uh, for its ability to help hold the soil, or excuse me, hold the inputs in the soil longer um, and allow you know, elements to be much more readily available to your plants. Uh, the benefits go much more beyond this, and this is why we have Russell on today is to be our expert and to help answer your question specifically about what it is, how it's applied, and how it can help you uh, improve your yields, your soil health, and uh, decrease those needs for, for uh, weed and pest uh, deterrence. Um, just a little bit about Russell. Uh, he and Life Earth Products, um, he is a leader in the humic product industry, and that's why I'm really proud to have him on today. He's been in the Humic Products Trade Association board for the past 10 years. He's the current president of the association. <clears throat> Excuse me. During the time, he's lobbied for the humic industry within the USDA, EPA, uh, a number of organizations and regulatory agencies. He spent 25 years in the mining, extraction, and marketing of the products. I don't know many people who know more about this element uh, and this, this tool and this, uh, this strategy and tactic that you can use on your farm than Russell. Uh, in addition, just for fun, he also runs a uh, certified organic cattle farm. Uh, you can learn more about uh, while we're watching. If you want to learn more, you can... Uh, it's liveearth.com is his website. That's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H.com. That's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H.com. Uh, anyway, Russell, uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for talking about humic acids and what we can do with our soil health programs today. So I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, hello to the world. It's um, always exciting to talk about humic products. Uh, my father, Open the mine in the early 80s. I'll got a slide on that here in a second. But, you know, as a young kid, it's all I've, you know, grown up and lived around. So for me, it's fun to talk about humix. It's my passion. Um, always excited about talking about it. Uh, I'm a certified crop advisor. I uh, consult on soils uh, internationally, do uh, landscape turf, uh, very unexciting row crops. But um, we're going to talk about uh, conventional crops today. We're going to talk, talk about organic crops. We're going to try to uh, try to bridge those all together. Um, all these soils are reliant on organic matter. and those nutrients being held by that organic matter. So we'll get in with the first slide here. Um, this uh, is a slide from the USDA, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. This is a, a downward spiral uh, of degradation of soil. And this is just how soil gets degraded and those elements that would cause soil degradation. And you can see there the very first, you know, intensive tillage, um, soil erosion, those kind of things, not adding those residues back that highlights the very first action point, which is the soil organic matter decreasing. So as your soil organic matter decreases, your aggregates break down, you, you have um, more crusting, more compaction, and, and then it just further compounds this downward spiral. So it's just kind of an illustration of the, the key components. If you can hit the action point there, you'll see that the, those components are soil organic matter is um, lost and also soil organic matter decreases, helping cause this further downward spiral. So uh, the um, if you can hit the next slide button there. There you go. That There's the highlight, those two points. And then if you hit the next sli slide button again, you'll see that uh, that resulted less soil water storage, less nutrient storage. Uh, and so those components of soil organic matter are necessary for those other crop inputs you're adding. So ultimately, the goal is reduce this downward spiral. And the first step is to add the organic um, acids back. So um, let's go to the next slide here. And um, what you'll see here is what actually forms humic substances. So we're gonna break down our, I don't like talking about carbon as a just category. You know, I, I hear it used a lot in the industry. And I, I don't like it because it doesn't describe how that carbon is useful to the soil and the microbes. 
So some of these uh, carbons, um, I, you've heard it broken down before, green, brown, and black, and you'll see that categorized here, where your green might be your, your um, plant and animal residues, that brown might be compost and manures, and then getting into the black, which would actually be your stable humus. Those carbons that are quickly degraded are sugars, cellulose, hemicellulose, those components, uh, carbohydrates, things like that. That's a new, new residues. Um, we're assuming that all that process has occurred. And we're, today we're just going to discuss about the humus. And you'll see the arrow there. That's those components that are stable, that stable fraction of organic matter that is no longer degraded by microbial activity. Uh, it's not the first food source by the microbes. Um, the microbes have been able to pick at it and break off all those double carbon bonds. And what happens is they break it apart, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignans, they get broken in these little chunks that will recombine. And over time, you'll see them form into smaller molecules called fulvic acid. That would be the smallest of the group. You'll see it in the yellow box there. Um, fulvic acid is soluble at all pH. And primarily, uh, it, it's small enough to be cell permeable. Um, we describe these organic acids based on how they function chemically, not just their size. So uh, humic acids is a little bit larger size than molecule. And when I say molecule, it's a grouping. They're, these are heterogeneous groupings of organic acids. So that grouping is categorized by how it behaves chemically, which is they're only alkaline soluble, which means as a, as a liquid, it might be soluble at pH 9, but at pH 5 or 6 might convert to a solid. So that's when we say not alkaline soluble, that's how we're describing it. It can convert to a solid at a certain pH. And then human is the last one, largest molecule of the grouping. It is insoluble, uh, largely attached to some clay particles and doesn't do a whole lot. You're going to see most of the discussion uh, be towards uh, humic and fulvic acid. So again, this describes how the humic substances are formed. We've kind of skipped over the whole process real quickly. Uh, but that gives you kind of a category where we're focusing in on is that humus portion. So uh, the next slide will show you um, where uh, soil organic matter is in relation to the soil. And I like this slide from the USDA because it frames how much soil organic matter is in an acre. So we kind of just punched out the math real quick and, and showed you if you took a furrow depth in an acre, that's six to eight inches, and took all that soil and piled it up, you would end up getting about two million pounds of soil. So if we were basing our calculations on a 1% organic matter change, that means we would need to add about 20,000 pounds of pure organic matter. That's pure, stable organic matter. Now, assuming that that product you're putting down is not stable organic matter, then we're going to say we need to use a conversion. So we're going to say about every 10 pounds of organic matter you put down, the microbes are going to eat it. They're going to digest it. It's going to be converted to CO2 and be respired back to the air. So that 10 pounds, is only going to convert to about one pound. So you really need to add on a per acre basis 20,000 or 200,000 pounds of organic matter, which ends up being about 100 tons uh, to get that stable 1% organic matter. Now, the USDA in, in there, um, you'll see a 1% challenge document they've got out there. And if you don't have a copy of that, look it up. It's, it's pertinent to both conventional growers, organic growers. Ultimately, that soil organic matter is our storage space, stores nutrients, stores water. So increasing that storage space will do that for us. They said if you add these cultural practices, and that's tillage, um, rotational crops, uh, cover crops, um, adding organic compounds like uh, humic acid and manures, you can change that soil organic matter in somewhere to three to 10 years. So it, this is not a quick fix. We're not advertising, you know, you sprinkle a pixie dust and your farm has changed. You've got to commit to this. You've got to say, I want to change my soil organic matter and reverse some of these detrimental things that have occurred because of tillage and not returning residues back to the soil. So I've included the link there for the, um, the US, USDA NRCS 1% challenge. You, you should check that out. But this is just to kind of quantify to people how much organic matter does take to change the soil. So um, let's pop the next slide here. Um, this is a little bit about our mine, our company. Um, it was founded by my father in the early 80s. Uh, we were originally looking for something else. We were looking for tar sands and oil shells. Um, the chemist said, hey, it make, might make a good fertilizer. And, and my father placed the claim. So we've been mining manufacturing for 30 years. Um, our ingredients are used in different industries, uh, dietary supplements, cosmetics, animal feeds. And you'll see the bottom, it's highlight fertilizers and soil amendments. So we're going to talk about that today. We're not going to talk about these other uses. But just remember, these organic acids have uses in other industries. Um, so if I, I reference you know, some of those industries that just remember, you know, this is an ancient plant deposit. Uh, this is a, 
the deposit we're mining is a semi-tropical rainforest. So think of the Amazon a long time ago. And the organic acid, those years and years and years of, of material have stacked up and fully degraded. So this product is no longer susceptible to degradation. When you put that organic acid down, it's stable. It's going to stay in the soil and it's going to hold and exchange nutrients. Unlike your active organic matter, those green, those browns that we had in a couple slides ago, where you, you saw those products are quickly degraded by microbes and 10 pounds might break down in one pound. Well, this is this, that stable component that it converts to. So just to illustrate to you the, the time it's taken to get this deposit down to where it is. So that's what you see there in that mineral deposit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll do a quick shout out to the trade association. So we're a founding member of the Humic Product Trade Association. The HBTA has established uh, standards for testing uh, these products, uh, definitions. We've worked um, very hard to get these definitions in place. Um, there's a lot of Me Too products out there, a lot of misinformation, you know, what is humic, what is fulvic. And so we help get those definitions down and even an international standard test uh, to help quantify them. So you'll see our, our organization is working very hard to advocate for humic substances. And I always try to give a shout out to the association. Um, look for this uh, association when you're buying products and support these members. You'll see them to be credible, reputable, and, and trying to promote good things in the humic industry. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you're not familiar with humic products, this is your first time um, learning about them. I'll, I'll just cover this real quickly. Uh, we describe them uh, both as liquids and dries. So humates would be the categorical description for a granular or a dry product. And, and typically that product is just spread as a soil amendment. Uh, either in a powder or a granular, you'll see that spread with the fertilizers mixed in or even mixed in with the manures, uh, depending on whether you're conventional or, or a certified organic operation. Uh, for some uh, crops, you'll actually see it banded in the row with the fertilizer. And the same is true with liquids. You can also see that mixed with an organic uh, fertilizer or, or a foliar application. Typically, the foliar application is usually a fulvic. Um, and then you'll also see these soluble powders, which you're mixing in sprays or other components. So that's typically how the product is used. It's almost added on as a carrier for all those other things. Uh, humic acid functions as shelf space, holds, stores, and exchange nutrients. So if you, make, you can mix that nutrient with the organic acid and put it into a soil situation that might be harsh, you might be able to retain that nutrient longer. So uh, next slide, please. So here are some general benefits. Um, this is taken from several USDA reports. Uh, what we see about the benefits of adding uh, these stable organic acids. Adding humus back to the soil will improve soil structure. Uh, adding humus will also um, increase microbial diversity. Um, water holding capacity is obviously increased. Uh, one number we see in the 1% uh, change uh, is, of soil organic matter is 1% change in soil organic matter can conserve 27,000 more gallons of water per acre. That's how much, uh, when we talk about improved water holding capacity, that's significant. That, that, that's, you know, the, the next rainstorm being able to hold that much more of it. So, um, you know, I should put a little asterisk next to improved water holding capacity, but we've got a slide on that later. So, um, nutrient exchange, enhanced uptake of, of micronutrients. Now, uh, California is one of those states where we're really limited on the claims we can make, but this is one of the uh, claims we can make in California is increased micronutrient availability. So you'll see zinc and iron and some of those, um, nutrients that might be uh, very hard to get uptake in, in uh, tree and nut crops. That is because uh, the humic acid helps increase that micronutrient availability. So uh, being a, one of the very restrictive states, we like to highlight that as a claim, you know, these substances do that. So we see a stimulation in the root and shoot growth of, of plants and it's seen in multiple reports. We don't know the mode of action. Uh, I've heard it described as hormonal, but there's also some theories on just increasing phosphorus availability and increased phosphorus availability could affect that root growth. So we know it's happening. We don't know the mode of action, but we do see that that is a general benefit of increasing organic acids like chemic substances. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the product we mine in our mine. Um, it's typically used as, as a raw material itself. Uh, you can see a picture of the, the granules there. Um, used at high rates, uh, they're using it for improving soil organic matter. Um, here in the Western United States, uh, it's a big benefit because of its pH 3.0. So that dose of acidity is, is welcome in some of these calcareous soils. Uh, the Western United States, essentially we're all sitting on a giant tones. Uh, there's just so much reserve alkalinity here with the lime that that, that acidity is very welcome. Uh, and so you'll see it blended with gypsum and products like that. Uh, on the East Coast and some of those more acid soils, you'll see, you can see it blended with limestone to mitigate that pH. That's uh, very commonly done. 
Uh, that way you get a boost of free calcium in addition to those organic acids. Uh, so we'll see phosphorus availability go up when you add humic acid. And I, I've mentioned that before, but typically use as a pre-plant to help establish your plants. And one tip for use, uh, more incorporation is better. And the other thing is humic acid loves nitrogen. You see a lot of interaction between the humic acid molecule and nitrogen. And one of those reactions is it pulls moisture out of the air. Now that's good in the soil possibly, but when you have a nitrogen fertilizer in your tender or spreader and you add humic acid and you get it pulling moisture out of the air, it makes spreadability a, a huge concern. So uh, pay attention to that. You don't want the uh, uh, fertilizer sauce in your spreader. So um, one, one just a pro tip there. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a trial we did in Arizona. This is a low organic matter soil. And what you'll see is over a period of time, again, you know, we're not gonna change organic matter in one year. We're gonna do this over a period of time. And this is a, a, almost a 10 year period where we continually added high levels of, of organic products. And you'll see that we affected the water holding capacity. You see two lines there, um, hard to tell the colors. The, there's a brown and a black one that kind of trend upwards. That's your water holding capacity and your soil organic matter. And as your soil organic matter went up, so did your water holding capacity. And you can see the control there uh, maintained uh, kind of a, uh, peach or a colored line there and, and the one at the bottom. That's your water hold capacity and your soil organic matter of the check. And as you can see, uh, obviously the check stayed the same and, and the other one went up. So the next slide kind of shows um, that water conservation, how much water we actually saved. And this is a, a 12 acre parcel and we cut our water in half. Now in Arizona, water's not free. Um, so for us, that, that was a huge savings in the project alone. But the, the more illustrative point is the next slide here is that water wasn't just water that was void of nutrients. That water was full of nutrients. And so those nutrients like the iron and, and the sulfur and the nitrogen were being rinsed away. And so less of those inputs were needed for that turf to be able to maintain that same color. And so what you'll see is not only do we conserve water, but we conserve some of those inputs. And so it was a double savings. Um, and this will vary on soil type, obviously, you know, this is low organic matter, sandy soils in, in, in central Arizona. You know, you, if you have nice loamy um, Midwest soils that are, have high organic matter, you might not see this water conservation. So it really depends on your soil type, but this is just one illustrative point that um, these products do as advertised. Over a period of time, if you focus on addressing your soil organic matter, you can affect water holding capacity and potentially those nutrients that are um, carried with it. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? So this is a, a slide, and it just shows a, a electron micro scan of clay particles. And on, on the screen there, you'll see an untreated one, and then one treated with um, a humic and fulvic acid. And what you'll see is those clay particles, those micelles, are, are somewhat polar, and they stack up just like plates. And the, the humic substance actually caused those clay particles to disaggregate. And so when you see that you're releasing those tightly bound soils, you're creating air and water movement, spaces for microbes to live, um, all, all those benefits you're trying to do in a healthy and sustainable soil. So one of the steps, again, when we talk about the downward spiral, what happens, you know, even organic acids might not be doing microbe food. It might be doing other things in the soil, like creating space for things those microbes need, oxygen, water. So uh, this is just a good illustration, you know, really close up what exactly is happening with those humic substances and how they affect other things like your soil aggregate. So uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a, a liquid uh, humic acid. And we de I described the granulars in detail, but I always like to throw the liquids up there. Uh, for conventional farmers, they will mix it with a UAN32 UAN or 2800, depending on your region. Uh, I got a couple slides here that shows uh, the interaction, how humic acid can help a plant get a longer look at that nutrient when mixed with the fertilizer. You'll see it used in the row and also as a foliar. And you'll see it added to soils with high salts. Um, you now people are asking, you know, how does that product affect high salts? And humic acid um, has a high cation exchange capacity. And that CEC is, it will attach to any positively charged ion. So let's say you had a whole bunch of extra sodium ions floating around. Uh, if you added a humic acid to that, some of those sodium ions will be attracted towards the humic molecule and if, essentially buffering them away. It doesn't make them disappear, but um, it kind of may create a, a, a situation where you have less sodium floating around the soil solution. So um, one reason to add it. Uh, again, we, we mentioned the increased micronutrient availability. We don't have to hit that point uh, again. Um, I've got another slide here on ash. I'm going to skip that point there and, and move on. 
Um, always do a jar test with humic acids. Uh, the reason I mention that is, again, humic acid is only alkaline soluble. So mixing with some acids can cause it to gel. Um, some molasses products, some fish products may have sulfur in there, lower pH, and you might get a gelled humic acid plus that product. So always do a jar test. Don't do that in your tank. Um, one pro tip would be water. Um, a lot of times, um, as an applicator myself, I would take an acid type product, water up the tank halfway, add my humic acid, and then it worked just fine. But if you add them to its concentrates, generally it will gel. So do a little experiment, see if watering up will help, but you will find that most of the times that will help. So um, that, that's the point there on the mix sequence. So um, next slide, please. We'll, we'll, um, this is a trial we did at the University of Tennessee, and this is the corn trial. And we were um, monitoring two things. We were actually monitoring um, yield, but we were also uh, monitoring whether we um, the burn on the plant. Now, uh, as you know, you know, these liquid nitrogens that when applied directly to the leaf can cause significant salt damage. And what we saw was that the humic acid significantly reduced that salt damage on the plant. Not only did it reduce salt damage, but it, it increased yield. So you can see here uh, on the left, you'll see the, the, uh, the treatments. Uh, the amount of uh, nitrogen added and the humic acid added to it. And you can see uh, as the humic acid was added to it, you, that same amount of nitrogen lasted longer for the plant. So they got more yield out of the same amount of, of fertilizer. So it's helping that plant get a longer look at that nutrient before it's lost, volatilized, or converted. So um, we've got multiple years on this corn trial. Uh, I think I've got one more here on the next slide. Um, again, you'll see this is a subsequent year and 2019, and I've got, the, the bars are uh, amounts of UAN and a UAN plus humic acid. So you see uh, the brown bar being just the nitrogen, the, the bar next to it, the yellowish color, nit that same amount of nitrogen plus humic acid. And then again, nitrogen plus humic acid and then two gallons of humic acid. And each time you see that yield going up, there's no more nitrogen added. It's just simply that humic acid is added, helping that plant get a longer look at that nutrient. So we see this very prominent in conventional agriculture, blending that with those high salt fertilizers and that, that fertilizer lasts longer. Um, you know, sometimes in organic agriculture, it's hard to see the immediate metric simply because you're relying on microbe activity and those kind of things. But this is a, a way of showing that. So uh, next slide. And this is one a quick slide here we're gonna just discuss is uh, testing methodologies do not correct for ash in some states. So the, the product we manufacture and here in the slide, you'll see is about a 14% ash. Now ash is not all bad. Ash is a, a laboratory measure of um, minerals. It could be fertilizers, it could be clays. So, you know, a little bit of ash is to be expected. There is potassium, phosphorus, those kind of things that would attach to humic acid molecule. Somewhere along the way, too much ash is just clay suspended in there and it can actually fortify your numbers. So pay attention to when you look at a label, when you see these really high numbers, there's really viscous liquids, look at the ash content. You might be buying a lot of things you don't need. So um, let's take the next slide here. How are we doing on time? Uh, okay. Yeah, Russell, we probably need to wrap up. Uh, we got tons of questions and we're about got five, it. Minutes, okay. five minutes over right now. So. Oh, uh, sorry. So, okay. Um, we'll just blast through this here real quick. Um, you know, adding humate can fast forward the, the soil building process, uh, adding organic matter. Um, so just speeding up that process. Um, the, that water conservation is definitely a benefit and adding organic matter can definitely help retain those nutrients. So um, improved nutrient availability obviously helps all those things, organic growth, uh, organic matter de deposition, and last, you know, increased nutrient uptake can help, you know, lead to higher yields. So um, I think that is the last of my slides here. And we're just happy to answer any questions. I apologize for going on time. Like I said, passionate about these products. You get me chatting about it. I might not shut up. So I, I love it. No, thank you for this. I appreciate it. You were uh, uh, not too far off at all. So thank you for everybody. Uh, we're we're going to go ahead and uh, a couple of announcements real quick before we get in the, uh, the Q&A. We're going to go ahead and go to 35 after the hour to make sure we get uh, 10 minutes of questions uh, and answers in. So we're going to extend this a little bit longer than we had programmed. I uh, hope you guys can stay with us through that. Uh, secondly, anybody who attended today is going to get a discount of 15% to our Healthy Soil uh, Summit later on this month, and you'll get a discount code uh, delivered to your, to your inbox. So just want to make sure everybody was aware uh, of that little announcement as well. So, uh, Russell, uh, a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to get into the ones that we had a lot of in common, which was uh, more of the application questions. Um, the 
one uh, Robert asked actually, he'd read recommendations for as little as one teaspoon of soluble humic acids per gallon mixed with a nutritional foliar spray. Is that reasonable? Um, I, possibly. So <clears throat> typically you would see most agricultural sprays uh, like our corn trials. Usually we back that up with saying, okay, this is the result. We went out with this amount of humic acid on corn, got this result. Look for the research behind it. You know, we saw economic yield at one and two gallons of humic acid per acre. That ends up being about 0.6 pounds of soluble powder. Um, one teaspoon might be seen a little bit light to me, but uh, sometimes, again, I, I've not done the research on that, so I can't verify it. it makes sense. Um, appreciate that. So probably a little trial and error. Uh, yeah, I, it seems a bit light to me, but again, look for research behind it. You know, usually, you know, good companies will, should have that research. Makes sense. Um, similar question, not quite, but uh, what's the recommended mix of, say, humic acid with a compost tea? Uh, what would you recommend uh, for a standard tea? Kind of what, how much humic acid would you be adding to that? I usually back calculate it out, actually. I, I look at my surface area and then back calculate it out. So um, let's say you wanted to go eight ounces per thousand square feet of humic acid. And you know that compost tea might uh, cover this amount per acre, or if you're covering the acreage, you know, one to two gallons of humic acid per acre and back calculate your spray out that way. Um, you might only be adding a teaspoon in a mix. Makes sense. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, another application question. Uh, if, you're, if you're completely no-till, how do you get this incorporated into the soil or, or what would you, how would you be applying this? So broadcast, I've seen it. It's, if you're conventional, a lot of guys will spray in the fall on the stubble. I'll see, um, uh, usually it's a combination, a, a cocktail, like thiosol, dextrose, and humic acid. You'll see those three together. You, you got a simple carbon to get those microbes going, an organic acid like humic acid to you kind of give them a substrate to work on. And uh, in the last of nitrogen, you need a little bit of nitrogen to break down those high carbon to nitrogen ratio um, stubbles like stover and, and stalks. Makes sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, question about uh, sourcing a little bit. Um, what exactly are you mining to get the uh, humic and fulvic acids? So our deposit is an ancient semi-tropical forest. Um, think of it as there's a time between peat moss and then coal in that transition period where those organic acids, cellulose, hemicellulose are broken down. You haven't had heat or pressure. Um, you know, if our family waited a while, we might get diamonds. I don't know. But for now, we're just mining humate. Uh, so humate deposits, uh, humic acids will start right after compost. You've got to look at what humic acids is. It's a result of that decomposition process. And I try to tell people, think of it, an apple. You know, when does the apple become compost? It's the same thing as when is humate created. You know, once those organic acids are start breaking down, once compost goes in the soil, it starts breaking down, the microbes aren't chewing on it anymore, that's when you start getting humates and humic acids. So this deposit we mine is just basically an old leaf pile. Great. Um... Thank you. Uh, we'll kind of connect the dots between that a little bit and uh, the nutrient levels and, and nutrients that, that humic acids can help deliver. We had a question uh, Mark asked about, uh, does it help a, a plant uptake of calcium for cell strength and boron as well? Are you seeing that? Yeah, so what we see is the CEC of the humic acid seems to have a buffering effect. So a lot of times um, we've had solutions with liquid fulvic acid, calcium and phosphorus, Without the fulvic acid in there, the calcium and phosphorus react and tie up. With the humic acid or fulvic acid there, we see the calcium will attach to the humic molecule and see less tieback. So it's not necessarily the humic is actually helping it be uptake more, but we're seeing less tieback because of it. And therefore, more is available to the plant. So you see more net available calcium, more net available boron because the humic acid is kind of working as a referee and reducing tieback for the phosphorus. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, we're going to get through a lot of these, I think. So this is, I, I appreciate this. Um, is there any risk as applying to this to affecting the microbe count or the biological matter count in your, in your soil uh, due to the acidity or uh, uh, the high charge? So no, I, the, you've got to put really high amounts to really make a big pH change. The, the illustration I always use is think of a, a, a drop of lemon juice in a swimming pool. You know, the pool of, of hydrogen or hydroxide ions you're adding versus what are in the soil or what's in your water, for example. Uh, it's just not there. You've got to add a, a large amount of, of, you might see a microcosm where that acidity is quickly reacted by the soil, but no, it, we, we don't see it. And we actually, we usually see increased microbial activity. Um, what you see humic acids is being used as both 
a food source where nutrients are stored, but also electron donor receptor. And we're kind of getting into some weeds there, but some bugs will actually use humates in a redux reaction where they're trying to oxidize and they need something to hold onto an electron while it breaks it apart. So we see increased microbial activity. Great. Uh, uh, thank you. So we're, and I know we're flying through these. So if anybody has other questions, uh, you can go ahead and email me at gm at acresusa.com. Uh, if we're not getting your question, then I'll do my best to relay them to Russell and we'll get uh, as many questions as we can answered in the long term for everybody. We've got about uh, three or four minutes left. I've uh, got a couple more questions I want to get through. Uh, again, this is related uh, to sourcing more of buying the product. How do I know? I know this is kind of a common um, issue in the industry. How do I know that the humic acid I'm buying is actually humic acid? So the USDA at first has a criteria. And, and so I'm just going to talk about organic products for now. Um, the USDA specifically stipulates that uh, a humic substance must come from a mined mineral. And so recently um, you saw some groupings like Omri actually delisted about 30 products from their fulvic category because that product passed a fulvic test, but it didn't come from a mined mineral. Now there are all kinds of products that will pass a fulvic acid test. Fulvic acid is only measured by hydrophobicity. So if you took, let's say malathion, which is obviously not a fulvic acid, pour it through the column, you would actually test as fulvic acid. So look at the source first, is it coming from a mined mineral? And, and then look at the test. So some tests will, will report differently than others. CDFA will report about half of a colorimetric test. There's an excellent paper by uh, Dr. Richard Lamar. I suggest you look at that and it shows comparisons of the tests and, and start there. The HPTA did establish an ISO test that helps correct for some of those adulterants. And in the future, states will be including that. It's a little seal that says HPTA test method certified. And that seal will be on the bag. So that's coming out. It's just barely uh, coming through the industry now. Thank you. So yeah, uh, asking good questions when you're buying, always a good thing, no matter what you're buying out there, right. a good tactic to have. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, another question, um, more about uh, human health. Are you seeing uh, demand on the human health side for uh, humic acids. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the one thing I see in the fulvic acid industry more than humic, the, again, thing to remember about humic acid, humic acid is only alkaline soluble. So as soon as humic acid hits your stomach, it's obviously acidic there. It's going to be a solid. It's going to pass through. A lot of the benefits that you receive uh, from consuming a humic and fulvic product is primarily from the fulvic because fulvic is soluble at all pH. It's smaller, it's still permeable, but we do see there's some interesting research on there. Um, particularly um, externally. We see a lot of um, good published research on help healing cuts and wounds. Um, there's some really good uh, research on that. Um, I, I wasn't prepared to present it, obviously, but yeah, it's, we see it a lot. Sure, and, the, and the, the person who asked the question was actually specifically mentioning Dr. Zach Bush. We know he's out talking a lot about using this for health purposes as well. So uh, I know he's uh, trying to promote that as well. So yeah. Um, I think we got time for one more question. So I'm gonna to try to find the best one here in the list. Uh, not the best one, but the one that uh, uh, capsulates all the other questions is really what I'm trying to do here. Um, I guess let's talk about testing a little bit. Uh, is there a way, uh, uh, you know, when you suggest, you know, how do people know how much to apply? What would you suggest going through the process of determining, um, you know, what, what, humic, what their humus levels are now and, and what their humic acid application levels should be? So the first thing I would suggest is do get a baseline test of your soil organic matter and look at that. Uh, soils that are lower in organic matter, have marginal pH, high salts, will, will absolutely benefit from, from granular applications. Um, it's the best dollar per value, and it's a good way to build up soil organic matter. You will, if you've got lower organic matter, there's, there's no way to eat an elephant but one bite at a time. So slowly adding those organic acids will build that up, that, that organic matter in the soil. The... Um, Next thing would be if your organic matter is sufficient in your soil, but you're seeing some um, nutrient incompatibilities or nutrient tieback. Again, I'll circle back to the calcium and phosphorus. Let's say you're trying to grow some high bushel corn and you're tr obviously trying to get a lot of phosphorus in the soil, a lot of calcium in the soil, they're antagonistic. So if you add uh, some humic acid to help buffer away some of that calcium, reduce some calcium tieback, uh, you might see more nutrient availability. Um, that slide I showed about the nitrogen, um, you know, you might have a high organic matter soil, but adding humic acid to that UAN might reduce burn and it might, might, might actually increase yield by attaching that nitrogen to an organic acid. So look at the applications and how these nutrients function. Sometimes you're just trying to prevent, you know, nutrients from uh, being antagonistic towards each other. Uh, but humic acids, they, I couldn't emphasize this point enough. 
think of them as shelf space. Hold, store, and exchange nutrients. Give a place for the microbes to do their thing like a workbench and help retain water. Great. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, thanks uh, to Live Earth Products for today's lesson on humic acids. Uh, all this was just great information. I learned a ton through this, so I hope everybody else did too. Uh, you can learn more from uh, liveearth.com. That's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H.com. Uh, you can learn more about humic acid and specific soil health tactics uh, coming up on August 25th, 26th at the second annual Healthy Soil Summit. You can learn more about that at soil.acresusa.com. We'd love to see a lot of you there uh, to continue this conversation and cover a little bit more ground than we could today. So again, I'm Ryan Slaybaugh and for everybody here at Acres USA and for Russell and Library Products, uh, we want to just wish everybody a good day and a big bountiful harvest this year. Thanks guys. See ya. Have a good day, everybody.